There's a weirdly large number of competing definitions about what games are, and what, if anything, separates them from average, unstructured play. For example, the designer Chris Crawford laid out a complex set of dichotomies distinguishing playthings, toys, challenges, puzzles, conflicts, competitions, and games in his 2003 book, Chris Crawford on Game Design. For the most part, I tend to agree with rigid definitions of games like Crawford's, but I'm not quite as certain about them as I used to be, so for the purposes of this video, I'm going to throw them out the window and instead focus on the ideas of the French sociologist Roger Caillois. In Kaiwa's 1958 book, Man, Play, and Games, he describes what he considered the four categories of play. Agon, which is competitive play, Alea, play based around chance, mimicry or role-playing, and finally Elinx, play based around vertigo. And what I think is especially interesting is that Kaiwa didn't view the difference between games and unstructured play as a strict binary. According to him, all play across the four categories falls on a spectrum ranging from Padia to Ludus. Padia refers to pure and unstructured play, and Ludus refers to structured games. Kaiwa's ideas are incredibly helpful for understanding play in general, but especially helpful for understanding the works of Keita Takahashi. Three, two, one. We are the Takahashi's games almost always revolve around simple, unstructured play, and most of them fall under the Elinx category. In his book, Kaiwa mainly defines Elinx as a destruction of personal equilibrium. This would be things like spinning around really fast, going on roller coasters, or even using recreational drugs. Activities where you volunteer to lose control over yourself. But Kaiwa also says that Elinx can refer to a destruction of moral order. Things like knocking snow off a roof and causing a mini avalanche, or banging pots and pans together. Being destructive just for its own sake can be really fun sometimes, and this is something that Takahashi's work leans into heavily. However, this loose, unstructured form of Elinx doesn't always translate that well into a virtual space. I think the reasoning comes down to Elinx being a destructive kind of play. Kaiwa describes the Agon and Mimicry categories of play as being creative, and the Alea and Elinx categories as destructive. The appeal of Elinx is that by being destructive, you're violating a social taboo and giving in to the urge to cause problems on purpose. The tangible, real-world disruption you cause is what gives Elinx meaning. So naturally, in a virtual space, Elinx loses those real-world consequences and therefore also loses meaning. Unfortunately, I think Takahashi's most recent game, Watam, is a victim of this. The game was designed to mimic his experiences stacking blocks with his children and then knocking them over, but without the real physicality of those actions, the whole thing feels kind of hollow. On the flip side, the creative forms of play, Agon and Mimicry, seem to have an easier time jumping into a virtual space. Animal Crossing and Minecraft are two obvious examples of this. Both mostly fall under the Mimicry category and favor Padia. Even without clear, defined structure, people are still able to sink thousands of hours into these games because unlike with Elinx, the satisfaction isn't dependent on experiencing real-world consequences. Creativity is a reward in and of itself. The obvious solution to making Elinx engaging in a virtual space is to forget about Padia and go all in on Ludus. If aimless virtual destruction is meaningless, you can give it meaning by enforcing rules and introducing dynamic obstacles to overcome, like for example, the police that try to kill you if you cause too much mayhem in Grand Theft Auto. But that's the coward's way out. How do you retain the spirit of unrestrained improvisational play while giving the game enough structure to make that destructive play feel meaningful? The answer is Keita Takahashi's masterpiece, Katamari Damashi. Katamari is not a game that cares about being a game. If we were to put it on Kaiwa's spectrum, it would skew heavily towards Padia, but it still has structured competitive elements to it, allowing it to meet a more rigid definition of a game like Chris Crawford's. We can see this most clearly by comparing Katamari to one of its contemporaries, Super Monkey Ball. Both games are centered around the physics of moving a ball, the differences come from their level design. Monkey Ball level design is all about challenges that explore a specific facet of the game's physics. In order to beat the game, you need to have an extremely good understanding of how the ball responds to its environment. But Katamari couldn't care less whether you understand the physics or not. The levels are more similar to playgrounds than obstacle courses, so even though the game has incredibly complex physics, there are no challenges that require you to use them. 
like the game goes through the trouble of explaining to you that longer objects will affect how the Katamari rolls, but there's never a point where you have to apply that knowledge to vault yourself over an obstacle or anything like that. The only reason those strange physics nuances exist at all is to make the act of rolling a ball feel more interesting to make the game more compelling on a basic tactile level and give each player a unique and unexpected experience. Katamari is concerned with interesting sensations, not interesting obstacles. Your core interaction with the game is rolling up different objects, but the stages are littered with so much stuff that fighting things to roll up isn't exactly difficult, and it becomes even less of an issue the longer you play, as your Katamari will eventually grow to such a size that you just suck everything up like a vacuum without even trying. The game wants you to just relax and play freely without much in the way of stress. That being said, we do need to talk about the game's timer. If you don't make your Katamari a certain size before time runs out, you get a game over and you need to start the level again. This is the game's sole piece of structure that pushes it away from Padia and towards Ludus. It may seem hypocritical to have a threat like this in a game that wants to be viewed as a virtual playground, but as I've already discussed, artificial destruction like in Katamari quickly loses meaning without some kind of motivating factor. And the time limit is a great way to motivate players, it's a sort of Damocles hanging over your head, but importantly it's hanging pretty freaking high above your head. These time limits are insanely lenient, even if you're playing very passively there's a good chance that you'll reach the size requirement with several minutes still left on the clock. So the time limits are technically a motivating threat, but so insignificant that you can still play at your own leisurely pace. Also, the fact that it's completely static as opposed to a more dynamic obstacle, like the aforementioned police in Grand Theft Auto, benefits Katamari greatly in my opinion. The timer goes down at the same rate no matter what, there's no way to stop it or add more time to the clock. Without any kind of time-related subsystem to manage, you're freed up so that the only thing you need to concern yourself with is rolling things into your Katamari. Thanks to the timer's lenient and static nature, the game is able to give you an obstacle to overcome without ever distracting you from the core appeal, which is having a playground to roll around freely in. The last thing I love about the timer is that it turns Katamari into an arcade game. Now when I say arcade, you probably imagine the kind of game that attracts the hardcore. The players that will dedicate their lives to these games, trying to get the highest scores they can. Catering to this intense outlook on games seems like it would be a total contradiction of Katamari's central values of unrestrained leisurely play, but in reality these two attitudes of casual and hardcore play coexist within Katamari in perfect harmony. Firstly, its openness means it's naturally suited for the arcade-minded player. In order to make a game compelling as an arcade-style score attack game, you need a large possibility space meaning deep mechanics and room to explore that depth. Katamari has both. The sprawling level design and nuanced physics, which exist to give casual players a loose and improvisational experience, double as a way to offer hardcore players a complex challenge. If you're trying to roll the biggest Katamari you can, or meet the size requirement as fast as possible, you really have your work cut out for you because the freeform design means that there's basically an infinite number of routes through these stages. The second way that these two approaches to games manage to coexist is that they are both purely voluntary. The aimless and unstructured play of Padia is not a means to an end, but an end in and of itself. There is no goal to work towards, no carrot on a stick to chase. We find the play intrinsically satisfying, so we continue to play. And similarly, the ludic desire to get high scores is driven by intrinsic motivation. The game can offer some systems to imply that it wants you to score well, but it can't force you to do that. It's something that needs to be opted into and come from a genuine place of love and enthusiasm for the game. It reminds me of the notorious Ursa Major level. The goal is to get the biggest bear you can, and the level ends as soon as you touch a bear of any size. Getting that biggest bear requires a ridiculous amount of patience and precision, but it doesn't feel out of place in a game like this because of the way success is framed. As long as you collect a bear, you win. The king expresses disappointment if you nab a tiny bear, but the next level gets unlocked anyway. Katamari shifts its responsibility to judge success and failure away from itself and onto you. So what it ultimately comes down to is a question of personal satisfaction. Are you happy with the size of your bear or not? And the same goes for all the levels. If you're playing the game for high scores, the only way you can win is by saying, I'm done, I've made the ball as big as I want it to be. So the looseness of Katamari's design, as well as the voluntary nature of the playstyles it focuses on, means that it can appeal to both kinds of audiences without ever explicitly favoring one or the other. 
In a way, I think it lends some credence to Kaiwa's ideas that play exists on a spectrum. The magic of Katamari is that it can occupy either extreme depending on your preference. And I wish more games would try to follow in those footsteps. I don't just mean bridging the gap between Pedia and Ludus though. I mean I want more games that celebrate play in its most pure and innocent form as proudly as Katamari does. There's a cultural tendency to write off Pedia as childish and frivolous. Most often, the kinds of play that gain mainstream societal acceptance are of the intensely competitive variety. Now obviously I have no problem with competitive games, but I think Pedia is just as valuable of an experience as Ludus is, because it's when the illusion of competition and rules are dropped that we can become the most honest and creative versions of ourselves. Video games might face a few unique challenges when trying to tap into Pedia that physical games don't, but Katamari shows us that those hurdles can be overcome, and doing so is absolutely worth it. Hi, thank you for watching my silly little internet video. If you made it all the way to the end, you're probably thinking, wow, this person is incredibly smart and sexy. I bet they know how to make some bomb ass video games. And you know what, dear viewer, you're in luck. In the description, you can find my itch.io page where I have a survival horror-ish adventure game called No One Can Ever Know and a tight as fuck minimalist arcade game called Endless Overdrive available. And if you're a loser who doesn't know how to use itch, you can also download a Steam version of No One Can Ever Know and the link for that is also in the description. I appreciate any kind of support these videos receive, but at the end of the day, my real passion in life is making games, so if you want to support me, please check out my itch page. Thank you again for watching, I love you, goodbye.